Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're looking at the Dreadnought Swamp Fire. So the Dreadnought Swamp Fire was first released in the United States in 1986. It was also sold in 1987 and unfortunately, like so many others, were discontinued in 1988. So as we kind of really notice here, Hasbro only really had these, um, you know, whatever toy out for roughly about three years before they kind of put them into... Uh, uh, discontinuation um, and here we are we have some wonderful front views on yojo.com so we have a wonderful front view with our kind of water uh, floats out uh, kind of raised up here in our rear view with the floats up in our ISO or our, our side view and of course this does give us quite a bit of um, Kind of protection to our our driver here driver slash pilot if you want to say it that way and it is an interesting take here having kind of this almost saw blade look to it uh, i don't know how effective that ever would be uh, to have that i don't think too effective seeing that i i don't think i've ever seen that on a helicopter um, and the fact that in a we'll say boat kind of mode um, this can be kind of kicked back, uh, kind of folded up so it takes up a little less room, and then we can kind of zoom around in the swamps that it, that they're ever so used to. Um, seeing that Zartan always seemed like he was based out of the Florida Everglades for the most part, um, him and his mercenary unit. And we have a nice another nice isometric view. Um you know, they were always kind of quirky. They always had, uh, you know, their, their own way of doing things. But, you know, it, it added a little extra flavor to everything. So, oh, goodness. Uh, just seeing that there's a price tag for what looks like it's uh, almost $75. Um, so, yeah. And uh, here's the, the back view to the box. And I do remember if you collected enough of these um, UPC codes, uh, the flags with the, the numbers and that, that got you the ability for mail-in orders, stuff like that. You had to get so many of them. And here's our instructions. And then here's our ever-so-popular schematics, which is where I try to grab what information I can if I don't have any other cards or anything available. Uh, and quite often I didn't. Um, now we do have the order of battle, which gave us information here, but there's another enough other vehicles where I didn't have that available. All right, so easily broken and or lost pieces. We have the gun for the swamp fire is commonly missing. The pontoons or pontoon arms, rotors and rotor head can be prone to breakage. So our Sunbow did give us this as they were kind of flying down an alleyway with Zorana. And then we have our Covert Assault Airboat. And it is 0.7 tons, has a one-man crew going at about 32 knots. Range uh, is about 270 miles. Armament is one hole mounted 20 millimeter electric cannon uh, with 1,300 rounds of ammunition. So that is actually a really big gun for sitting on there at only that weight. Um, those were not light guns. Now, being on a Bradley, we had a 25 millimeter. And, um, you know, here again, it's, it's a small, simple mount for that in comparison to what we had. And that was a pretty hefty gun. Uh, I believe it took two of us just to carry the barrel. Um, so, okay, and then we have a newer file card. So let's see what we have that, that changed here. So we're still at 0.7 tons, um, 32 knots for our, our speed, which is staying the same. We still have the same 270 mile range. We have armament, one hull mounted electrically powered 25 millimeter cannon with 1,300 rounds of ammunition. That is actually quite a bit of ammo for that gun. Uh, there's quite a bit of weight to that, so I think you probably 
be over your 0.7 tons there. But um, when the Dreadnoughts were planning on making a hit and run attack, the Swamp Fire is their vehicle of choice. Its ability to change from attacking on the water to attacking in the air in less than 30 seconds simply by lifting up the hydraulic gas filled pontoons and engaging the rotor blades while having no battle stamina in the prolonged firefight. Swamp Fire's best features is or are in its quickness, uh, adaptability, and camouflage. Experimentation by the Dreadnoughts have given the Swamp Fire a very unique automatic camouflage ability, making it extremely difficult to spot when it is hidden. Like I said, this is a very interesting concept. I'm not knocking the concept. I think the cannon's going to be a little on the big side, though. All right, and then last but not least, here's our, our picture going for the commercial. Let me go from there. Now, this is another one of those, you know, smaller vessels. Um, it only retailed for just under $5. So, you know, not a very expensive vehicle, but do keep in mind that, you know, back some almost 40 years ago, that that was a quite a bit of different uh, money sense here. So in Brazil, we have what would be our um, Python Patrol version of this. So, okay. So as we look at this as our vehicle here, um, okay, yep. Bringing this into our GI Joe slash Star Wars Galaxy, um, if this is at speeder scale, uh, I'm taking a, a pot shot at how long this is going to be. I have it at roughly about 15 meters, so or 15 feet, so it's about 4.5 meters. Has a crew of one. I put in passengers of two because just how everybody just jumps onto something or whatever, I figured, you know, we'll throw that in here. Now, I gave it a cargo capacity of 45 kilograms because that's kind of the standard I, I'm used to seeing. And I figured that you would have about one half coverage. Um, now, this is where I kind of, kind of goofed up here a little bit. Now, I did put um, altitude as ground. And I think that's going to have to change here. So let's put ground. Um, let's see. Surface. Slash. Um, air. Let's see. You know, something that doesn't have, have any actual... You know, you're, you're, you're trying to see that we it's not an actual star uh, starfighter or traditional airplane or whatever. I don't know how high up our standard aircraft would go. And actually, I suppose I could try and look that up here real quick, although it's not something I normally look. Um, Um, here, I'll do a flight ceiling of a Cessna 172. I think that would be a good kind of starting point. Unfortunately, I've got pop-ups all over to Dickens' place here. So, um, cookies this and that and everything else. So... All right, so they're saying for a Cessna 172 is between 13 and 15,000 feet. So why don't we put down roughly about 11,000 feet? Um, I don't know if that's going to be a very good number or whatever, but I'm thinking that, you know what, I think it has some merit to it. Um, 
All right. I'll move this back over. Oops. And then I forget the feet. Like I said before, I mean, sometimes when I'm thinking of this stuff or whatever, I don't, you know, there's, there's things that do escape my mind. And then when I come back and I look at it, it's like, oh, yeah, we weren't thinking of this, were we? So here we are. Um, kind of set this down here a little bit. All right. So I gave it a maneuverability of 2D, but seeing that this is a C level and um, kind of air, so let's put uh, a 2D C. Um, and then we're going to do, you know, being a helicopter, we'll, we'll give it a 3D. For the air, um, maybe I'm wrong on this, but you know we'll give it a little bit better air than than on the water. Seeing that they also do mention in here that uh, the flexibility and the the ability to actually just kind of skid out a lot of there, I think that might represent that a little bit here. Um, so it said we are at what 32 and 32 knots, so that. I did do a, an equation on that one. Um, so it comes out roughly about 40 miles an hour or 64 kilometers per hour. So uh, I put it in there as that because what I'm looking at now, it's not for old dummy me. Um, I don't really understand what knots are all that well. Um, so I'm just being honest there. Uh, it's kind of my ignorance which I'm fine with. Uh, I'm fine with understanding I have an ignorance issue at times. There's things I just don't know, and I will probably never know on some things. I did give it the one light laser cannon. Uh, front, of course, it's, you know, front, speeder scale. Fire control is 1D. I figured it's it's hole mounted. It shouldn't be swiveling, so it's just going to be what it is. Um and it's going to be a damage of 4D. Um, I'm just kind of wondering if I should leave it that way or not. You know, typically, especially if we're looking at it as a 25 millimeter now, having been on a Bradley, a 25 millimeter going up against the tank usually just kind of irritates the tank. We, we weren't penetrating the armor. Um, so I think that could very well work. And if we do go down to um, like infantry or whatever, um, you know, that, that, that's, you know, it's doing a little extra. But, you know, I'm sitting here looking at it, and I'm sorry. I'm, I think I'm going to move it back up to a 5D. So just one of those second-guessing myself again. Um, you know, just trying to keep everything in, in flavor here because it's real, it's going to be really deadly to anybody that's on foot if you hit them, which is going to be hard to do the way this thing is kind of set up. Um, and I think most of the time, and of course, the cartoons weren't done in a very bloodthirsty way or whatever. Typically, you would be shooting at rocks and you keep people from getting here to there. Uh, it's done in strafing people duck out of the way or whatever. Um, but if you did hit someone, now it would be 7D damage. So you're rolling seven dice, not just six. So chances are someone's probably not going to make it out of here. But if we go to shooting at a tank, it's only going to be three dice, not five. Um, our fire control would actually go up a little bit. So it would be easier to hit. Yeah, I think this, this works out. Even if I left it alone, I think it would still be okay. But I think this does give it a little bit more bite here. And being at going from a 20 to a 25, yeah, I think 5D would probably work a little bit better. So I think, I think we're safe leaving it here, um, and we'll go from that point. So um, with that, I mean, let, let me know what you think in the comments. It's always fun bringing this. It's, it's interesting kind of brainstorming for all this stuff. Um, and we just keep plucking away. 
We have a lot of years to go. Um, we have one more for 1986, and then uh, we're, we're going to start jumping into 1987. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for visiting, and we'll see you in the next video.